Um, thanks, Skinder. Thank you, everybody. And also just to extend my thanks to John for joining us tonight. Um, we're really, really thrilled to have the unfinished conversation downstairs. Um, so tonight is the first night of a nine-week run of the show. As Skinder mentioned, we've got several other events coming up, um, including the, the big symposium on the 8th of June. But I wanted to use this um, uh, event tonight as a, a jumping off point into all of that. So providing an introduction to John, his practice, and of course the unfinished conversation. So just a very, very brief introduction as we get into the questions. Um, John was born in Ghana and he moved to the UK when he was about eight years old in the 60s with his, with his siblings and his mother um, to escape the coup that was happening in Ghana at that time. He grew up in London, where he continues to live and work today, um, not just as an artist filmmaker, but also as a, a lecturer um, and a writer. And for the last 30 years, his practice has been committed to giving a voice and a presence to the legacy of the African diaspora in Europe. Um, his work has been widely shown um, internationally at galleries and festivals such as Documenta, The Serpentine, Whitechapel, uh, the Liverpool Biennale last um, autumn, which is where the Unfinished Conversation premiered, um, the Museum of Modern Art in, in New York, and um, of course, New Art Exchange tonight, put it at the top of that list of places. Um, and his films have been shown in international film festivals such as Cannes, um, Toronto, and um, Sundance. But before we come to, to all of that, I wanted to take a moment and, and step back towards the beginning of John's career. Um, so looking at kind of 1982, where you'd studied at um, Portsmouth Polytechnic and co-founded what is now the, the very, very well-known media workshop, the Black Audio Collective. Um, I believe it was sociology that you were studying at that period, and I was really interested to know how you um, got involved with film and the visual arts and, and, and how this kind of love affair with the, the medium of, of moving image began. Um, Malini and this august institution, thank you very much for both staging the unfinished conversation, the conference, as well as this conversation. Um, how did I get involved? Well, it's, I mean, I ended up doing sociology in a way by accident mm -hmm. because I'd been involved as a student activist in London. And I was expelled from three further education colleges. I didn't get quite the degree, the A-levels I was supposed to get. And so sociology, the sociology department in <laughs> Portsmouth <laughs> ended up being the one that would take me. And I'm very grateful to, to, to them um, because uh, the department at the time was uh, right next door to the one of the first cultural studies degree courses in the country. Mm -hmm. um, it was next to the fine art department. And it was run in a way like a kind of modular American degree course. Mm -hmm. So you could take you know, film studies in the art department or uh, popular culture in cultural yeah. studies and so on. You know. um, so the, the degree itself was a sort of jumping off point for me. And in a way, it allowed me to reconnect with many of the themes and obsessions that I'd had before I went to university. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a Super 8 enthusiast. I had a Super 8 camera from the age of, I think, 10 or 12. Uh, I was a member of the school Super 8 club. I run a number of film societies in London um, in the 70s. You know, so there was, there was always mm -hmm. that kind of moving image, uh, interest and obsession. Mm -hmm. um, what the sociology did, which is an extracurricular thing, was that it introduced me to a range of people at the yep. Polytechnic, now university, and allowed me to meet um, the nuclei mm -hmm. of the group that I helped co-found in, yep. in the early 80s. So that was the main value mm -hmm. <laughs> of sociology. Over and above that, it introduced me to a range of thinkers, um, including Stuart Hall, um, whose ideas and, and writings and ways of seeing has informed just about everything I've done. Really yeah. 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 
And was there a formal training with moving image or visual arts, or is it just something you became interested in, saw, wanted to do, started to do? You know, this is, this is the sort of interesting thing for me, um, just how much um, time-based work mm -hmm. and its production has changed in this country. Because I had a magazine called Cinema Rising, which was the first, the first issue of Cinema Rising from 71, 72. Oh God, mm -hmm. that sounds like my film. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Just finishing. <laughs> um, and the first, I think the second page in it, this first issue, li listed the number of independent filmmakers mm -hmm. working in England at the time. I think there, might, there were about 40, 45. Very few of those would have been formally trained. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there just wasn't a tradition of time-based work as something you formally studied. Yeah. Um, and we were, my generation, I suppose, were the last of that, you know, as we, um, because it's the very uh, artists and filmmakers who were part of that first wave of independent filmmakers, avant-garde mm -hmm. filmmakers, who then started teaching the the, the stuff on the courses, know. You yeah. know, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it, it was a sort of strange time where uh, most people were autodidacts. We all learned uh, yeah. as we did it. And, and part of the ethic of avant-garde cinema was precisely that. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it was not to be uh, schooled into dogmas about how to do anything, mm -hmm. be it lighting or how to treat film stock or grain, yeah. you know, all of that was part of the initiation into mm -hmm. avant-garde practice. You had to, you had to learn, quote yeah. unquote, yourself yeah. in the process of doing it, whether it's at uh, informal spaces like the London Filmmakers Co-op uh, or uh, you did it at home. You know, most of the people I knew uh, uh, and the ones who taught people like me, mm -hmm. Simon Fields and the uh, Peter Giddells, I mean, none of them had been formally, mm -hmm. quote unquote, trained, yeah. and they yeah. would have not wanted that. That yeah. wasn't part of, part of the thing. So it's, it's one of those interesting mm -hmm. you know, conceptual leaps in yes, how one yeah. approaches filmmaking. And your reflections on filmmaking at that time, in terms of what you saw when you experienced film, be it in a standard cinema or an art house cinema or a gallery setting, mm. Uh, what were your reflections on, on that? Well, I mean, I lived uh, off the New King's Road in Chelsea. I grew up there. Around the corner, straddling a corner of the New King's Road and Fulham Road, mm -hmm. was a very famous rep cinema called the Paris Pullman. And I, I mean, I bunked into the Paris Pullman like literally <laughs> every day uh, since the age of 15. So I knew. I knew the art cinema repertory extremely well. Mm -hmm. By the time I was 21, I'd seen most of those people because they were all shown, whether yeah. it's Orson Welles or Ozu, or, you know, they'd all been shown. Going to university um, uh, was my first introduction to experimental cinema. Mm -hmm. So it's really at university in oh. the late 70s, early 80s that I saw the, the canon of avant-garde filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, um, uh, as I said, I met all these other guys, Trevor Matheson, Edward George, you know, Lena Gopal, people in, in this place. And we all had twigged the same thing, that it didn't seem to matter whether it was avant-garde film or art cinema, or in fact mainstream uh, films. What, what marked them for us was our absence. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You could see that you weren't in any of this yeah. stuff, you know. Um, and so that became part of the ambition, of course, uh, literally yeah. to write yourself into these multiple uh, schools, multiple mm -hmm. histories, multiple ways of, of, of constructing images. So, so just coming on to that in the, the Black Audio Film Collective, so you've yes. met at university, you'd co-founded co the group collectively, yes. everyone came from different backgrounds, sociology, art, English perhaps, and you had this uh, shared objective of producing work that focused on black history and culture. And this was, of course, Britain in the early 1980s. So you were, you were touching on it then in terms of the kind of absence of um, the black community within film. But if maybe you can tell us a little bit about the 
political climate at the time and, and your experiences, which, which must have essentially um, kind of created this, this objective of the Black Audio Film Collective? I mean, by the time we, we got going, uh, and you have to remember, most of the people in the group I'd known, not at university, but in fact at further education colleges. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they were either there just before I got there or we were there together. So I'd known them since the mid 70s. We'd pretty much read the same kind of stuff. Um, had, I mean, I think because of my proximity to the Paris Pullman, I'd probably seen more films than most, most um, others in the group. But, you know, the fact was that people had also been, been watching stuff. And I, I think the, the, the task was twofold, because you were aware that there was this monolith called the black community, which circulated not just in um, political mm -hmm. analysis and cultural you know, uh, pronouncements, in the culture in general, but that sense of this monolith also functioned in moving image work, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, I mean, all of us, to the last person, would talk about this particular program. And it wasn't just outside, it was also in your head. There's this program called Police Five in the 70s. And those of you who are my age, you remember this and know exactly what I'm going to say. Now, <laughs> you know, nobody had to say it, but, you know, occasionally on Police Five, which was on every Friday, I think, no? On Friday night. It would list the, the criminals <laughs> and suspects who, who Shaw Taylor was looking for. And you sat there just hoping they wouldn't show that photo kit of a black person. You, know, you, you just knew that somehow you were implicated in this drama mm -hmm. of naming. And part of the project, for me, uh, which was really in the first essay manifesto that we wrote was to say, look, we want to break this thing down, mm -hmm. right? We want to problematize this monolith. We want to take seriously the question of representation, which is both a political and an ideological mm -hmm. uh, project. Um, and we will work across a range of practices because the object was to deconstruct this yeah. monolith. Yeah. You know, um, so we weren't, I mean, and I think this is important to stress, there were people who were trying to make films about the black community. We were not one of those. No. We were trying to question more than assert mm -hmm. what made up this quote unquote community mm -hmm. um, and what the, the stressing of this monolith repressed. Yeah, in yeah. other words, what was kept off in order to keep this idea of one singular, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a historical monolith mm -hmm. called the black community. So that was, that was really the project. The project was yeah. to make black life more complex. Mm -hmm. um, and the complexity, yeah, yeah. But to make sure that it wasn't, you know, you know, people always accuse us of this. Oh, you guys were just having kind of No, it's not that we were trying to Im impose a complexity on that mm -hmm. life. You knew that that life was made up of yeah. myriad strands, which were complicated, you know. Uh, and you wanted the, the, the project to mirror that complexity of mm -hmm. black life, you know. Which in a way is what you didn't find in other forms of representations, either popular ones or avant-garde ones, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. So that really was the project. If there was a project, that was it, yeah. you know, for me anyway. And I suppose, coming on to Hansworth Songs, which was the debut film of the collective which really uh, built the profile, brought kind of critical acclaim, um, is, exemplifies all of that. But um, we'll, we'll move on to a quick five minute clip of Hansworth songs because what I was really interested to look at in that are, are these concepts, but also to explore the, um, perhaps what I would term your kind of trademark technique of how you use imagery and how you build imagery, kind of intermingling and interweaving the archive with newfound footage, with stills, with text, with these um, epic soundscapes as well. Um, so we're just going to show a clip. It lasts about five minutes. It starts about three minutes into the film. Um, and then we'll maybe talk about some of those uh, concepts and those structural devices. <laughs> As you can see, the whole 
It's the 11th day of September, 1985, and the Home Secretary is standing in a Hansworth Street with confused eyes. The masses saw him struggle for composure, and they heard him mutter to journalists, These are senseless occasions, completely without reason. Somebody said behind him, The higher the monkey climb, the more he will expose. You can see the problem. You can't really say it's a colour fight, you, know. you can't put it down to it, right? But it's like a man say, most of the shops them will get burned, let's face it. It's Indian own most of them, you know, understand? And it's just unfortunately that them shops they burn and an Indian own them, so it's mostly Indian paste burned down if you come to that. But one and two different kind of people, white man get licking at the process, black man get licking at the process, you know? Enough man feel it all over, you see? So you can't really put it down to colour fight. You understand? The man them are a fight for a cause, man. And it was not no black people were burning neither. It was just chucks. Mix. Yeah, mix, mix, man. See, you want to know where it start from, really. He's a, he's a stupid police boy. Yeah? Where, 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 see a man park on a double yellow line and dry him out and push all the mid in a passing bus wheel, that the driver for us scan pan him brakes. See? Finna crush our brains. Now the people them never like it. So it's just fight. So them whole another brother and sit down pan him. And the people them never like it. So it's just fight. So them arrest them and the people them say release them. And them are going with foolishness. So blood start. You over? So as the man said before, now others hear in the news, rush from outside and all about, and rush in time to look for some pickings. Yeah. Yeah? You over? And you have some as well as black against Indian. As the brother showed you before, rubbish that too. Yeah. See? Yeah. It's just police and them stupidity. Yeah, you know what what I mean? them keeping up on black people. And black people, you just feel that they have had enough. See? So everybody just join together for cramp and paralyze them stupid situation.
So the piece was, of course, um, kind of retelling the happenings of the uh, disturbances at that time in Hansworth, Birmingham and London. Um, and within this piece, The Unfinished Conversation, Nine Muses, um, I'm really interested in your use of non-linear narrative and they're very hard to kind of present within a five minute clip but there is a sense of a continuum and a story is being told but um, in, an, in an alternative format um, I, I interpret it that kind of certain scenes are set up or certain questions are set up which kind of invites the audience in to come and kind of make their own interpretations about what perhaps they are being shown and, and what, what are the absences within that so Maybe within the uh, kind of example of Hansworth songs, I was interested if you could talk about um, structural devices you use within your work and the, the kind of intentions behind that. I mean, the, the, the structural devices do have a sort of, if you like, formal technical dimension, but there's an ethical one, which is quite important to also lay out. And I think it's important to lay it out now, especially here, because. Um, one of the guys who had the most to do with the form the Hansworth songs took is sitting there, Van Lee Berg. I mean, I would, Van Lee, you know, had these photographs and I'd go and see him. I think I must have been to your place like 16 times during that edit. I mean, quite a lot, you know. So you're hearing these voices. I'm hearing Van Lee talk about, you know, and there's this man who I just think is extraordinary, you know, in the beginning, who we met in the street corner, who pretty much just puts the case mm -hmm. for what happens in the most succinct form imaginable. Mm -hmm. And that guy did something most politicians hadn't been able to get their hands on. Yeah, you know, yeah. He provided you with an anatomy of the, of the event in two and a half minutes. So you think, okay, well, I'm getting all these voices. Mm -hmm. Van Lees, you know, uh, Mark Stewart, who remade the uh, rip, um, Jerusalem version that you hear that mm -hmm. was, you know, a guy who was a member of the pop group and then was in uh, a group called the Mafia. I'd known, the, you know, the, the music and him and so I'm speaking to him about mm -hmm. what to do with the track. You know, so you're getting a, a cacophony of voices coming at you, mm -hmm. all of them suggesting narrative possibilities. And part of the ethical aim, I think, is to find a way of seamlessly, or not, mm -hmm. whatever, uh, interweaving these voices so that what you're left with is something that isn't just a testament to your take on it, mm -hmm. but to the variety of witnesses who you've been privy to, privileged enough to hear speak yeah. Or, yeah. or watch their photographs. Or, you know, it's, it was really very important to us that, that having decided this wasn't a criminal set of criminal acts alone, mm -hmm. it was that too, but it, wasn't, mm -hmm. it was more than that. Mm -hmm. It was important to, to, to invite an orchestra of voices mm -hmm. uh, that will perform this fugue yeah. to, to industrial decline. You know? um, and so the question then was, what form should that take? Should you then do this and try and hide the fact that this is that there are these multiplicity of voices at work. Should you try and hide that, or be, or do something slightly more, dare I say, Brechtian, mm -hmm. where you lay bare mm -hmm. the stitches so that people can see yeah. the tapestry for exactly what it was, which yeah. is a series of uneven stuff. But all of them amounting to something. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to say something about England in the 80s, and you know that the the new right, the Thatcher gangsters and their cronies were wrong. Mm -hmm. You know that they had no idea what's going on. You know that the people you've spoken to do. And so the question then is, what is the formal means by which this disparate set of knowledges that one has acquired, how does it coalesce and cohere into a piece? Mm -hmm. And in the end, that's what Hansworth became. You know. um, and I'm as important in the image as I am in the, in the sound. Yeah. Of that. You know, the yeah. textures of people's voices, you the know, you music. hear that. Yeah, you, I hear that guy and he says, sound. to clamp and paralyze their stupid situation. Mm -hmm. Not situation, but situation. You think, okay, there's a level of uh, linguistic dexterity going mm -hmm. on here, right? Uh, 
because this man feels somehow that the words themselves are not enough to explain what he wants to do. So he's inventing his own. Now, if, if a guy on a street corner who's really seen as a sort of gangster, drug dealer, yeah. can do this and provide you with a sense of what happened in Handsworth in 85, then, I mean, you know, I'm a university trained idiot, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> I should be able to do something, yeah. you know, which is comparable if not better, because I don't think it is about being better, but at least comparable, mm -hmm. you know, something that says, I have reached the form, the formal limits of the available narratives for explaining this thing, and we need to go outside of it to begin to come up with other means by which you speak mm -hmm. of this moment. That's really where the, 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 the interest in, in bricolage and montage yeah. and and sound comes from. And, and what was the response when it was shown in 1986? Um, was it shown <laughs> cinemas, uh, galleries? Yeah, I mean, we were... Uh, it was uh, profoundly successful, mm -hmm. uh, quote-unquote, in a variety of ways. We won a whole number of awards, and the film was shown in cinema here, and it got taken all over the world, et cetera, et cetera. But it was, it was also... Uh, profoundly unsuccessful in some ways because um, the minute it came out, it, it generated this whole uh, litany of complaint in the pages of The Guardian, yeah, which yeah. in the end served its purpose. Mm -hmm. But for the first couple of months, we were extremely worried about mm -hmm. how things might go. Yeah. yeah, because I guess there was a quite kind of famous period where Salman Rushdie had criticised the piece. Stuart yes. Hall defended it. This was played out, as you say, in the, the pages of The Guardian um, at the time and, and created a very kind of critical moment for those wider conversations, those important conversations around what it was to be black and British, um, the importance, the need for kind of multiple voices, multiple uh, degrees of representation, mm. perhaps being talked about for the first time in a more mainstream context. Yeah, so I mean, someone... Um, um, I remember we met him um, when the fatwa was still on. Mm -hmm. He was in Hyde and I wanted to do something on him, so we, we met. And it was the most surreal and extraordinary uh, moment because, you know, as we arrived, all these police officers were arriving with guns. And, you know, and we, we, we met and spoke for a couple of hours about that moment again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, in retrospect, I now understand where he's coming from. I still don't agree, but this is where he was coming from. Essentially, uh, Salman Rushdie's critique of the film was that it had no ethnographic ver veracity mm -hmm. to it. He said, look, there are real lives in Handsworth, there are real um, people, and um, they are not the riot. Mm -hmm. they, they, they are the majority, and so what you should have done, rather than concentrating on the riot, mm -hmm. is to find these real lives as a counterpoint to what's going on. Right? My thing, and I think our thing was, um, Listen, dude, since we'd already been named as the problem, <laughs> you really have to confront it. There's no yeah. way around this. Yeah. You know? um, and in fact, the reasons, one of the many uh, myriad of reasons why you've been named as a problem is mm -hmm. precisely because of the exhaustion of the ethnographic narrative. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, because the ethnographic narrative, i.e. the idea that somehow there are people of colour and we have rich lives and interesting cultures, blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, that, that language had clearly been exhausted. Otherwise, we wouldn't be seen as criminals. <laughs> you know? um, so, so another means had to be found um, to do it. I mean, it's not that we disagreed with his position, but it just seemed to us that in situations of emergency, emergent discourses mm -hmm. needed to not be so respectful of mm -hmm. genre and boundaries and you know you don't need to I mean, yeah. you know, no one was paying us this was we were doing this by ourselves yeah, yeah. you know we the members of the collective we were working production design here assistant sound recording mm -hmm. here buying film stock going to mark carling renting a camera or getting a camera for mm -hmm. shooting this stuff i mean i wasn't doing all of that to just legitimize some bankrupt notion of narrative which says that black people are nice really if you look beyond the crime, you know, you can't, I mean, <laughs> it seemed to us the problem was to confront the question of the crime, to say, how is it, what makes it possible, which is why we return to that primal scene of the arrival again and again and again. 
happening? What happens between that pristine image of black innocence when you see people coming off a boat and they're clearly not coming to start riot? <laughs> uh, and as I've said many times, you know, nobody on that boat is saying to themselves, you know what, when I get to England, I'm going to give birth to three boys, and then when they grow up, they're going to be gangsters. I mean, you know, nobody, nobody does that. It's not a utopian rhetoric, you know, and everybody on that boat is coming with a certain utopian, you know, um, hope in their being. That, that's the whole point of moving. Mm -hmm. You don't move except for, for that utopian impulse. Mm -hmm. You think over there, things will be better. So if things have not been better for your kids, then something's gone wrong, which mm -hmm. is not just to do with you, but somehow the conjunction of your ambitions and the society's wishes for you. Yeah. Right? And so you have to look in that space for what the problem mm -hmm. is, not necessarily always at the kids, so-called kids. Yeah. You know? yeah. um, and that's why someone's mm -hmm. wouldn't have worked. I mean, you know, he, I, he's a great writer. And mm -hmm. I, I love what he does, but it just wasn't trying to write, uh, yeah. make a film version of Midnight's Children was not the answer, no. it seems to me. You know? And who was Stuart Hall in that moment for you? Ha. Huh. <laughs> Well, Stuart. Was there already a formal yeah, relationship? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Stuart. You know, you've got to remember that Stuart's uh, the 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 basically that generation, my generation, the people whose parents were the Windrush group, who come of age or become eighteen and nineteen or voting mm -hmm. age in their seventies, were looking. We were, you know, because it was clear the culture didn't want us. <laughs> it was. He made it very clear that he wasn't interested in. You know, we were a surplus underclass, mm -hmm. effectively, because the, the, already you could see that the industrial base was shrinking, and it's like, well, okay, you know, we don't know what we're going to do with their parents. What the hell are we going to do with them? You know, um, especially since they don't want to go into the factories anyway, which yeah. are closing. So there was this weird uh, space, uh, and so we were searching, and there were a range of radical thinkers um, on the left who were black, mm -hmm. who were very useful. You know, Sivan Anden at the Institute of Race Relations was extremely pivotal mm -hmm. in, in how he framed who we were and how we should look at ourselves. Of course, the Colin Prescott's and the Ricky Cambridge's, the people around the Black Liberated were useful. But in all of that constellation, of course, Dark as How and the Race Today, Lord, et cetera, et cetera. But in that constellation of black um, radical voices, Stuart was slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, he always gave the impression that he was speaking uh, uh, about us, mm -hmm. that he was concerned with this question of black Britishness from the get-go. And so we were drawn to, to him, not more than the others, but mm -hmm. we were certainly drawn to him. And um, at the time of Hands of Songs, given the fact that he had been in Birmingham for you know, almost I think almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. you know, he got there in 64 and didn't really leave until the 80s. Um, we invited him to, to come and have a look at the rough count. And, you mm -hmm. know, so he was involved you know, in the process, mm -hmm. uh, as is Van Lee and a whole range of other people. He, mm -hmm. was, he was there giving his tuppence worth, and you know, some yeah. we took and some we didn't, etc. cetera. Um, but he became absolutely central when the debate on Sam, the mm -hmm. Salman's article appeared, because yeah. Stuart was the second person to write immediately after the article, challenging Salman's uh, yeah. uh, claims mm -hmm. for the ethnographic mm -hmm. and, and effectively saying that, that we had the right to make mistakes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the process of trying to find new forms that spoke specifically about our condition. Yeah. And um, I don't think he's moved very far from that <laughs> position. You know, yeah. I think he's, he's been pretty much of that persuasion all his life. Yeah. Maybe. And what other opportunities do you feel that he perhaps carved for you as a creative practitioner um, for the Black Audio Film Collective, you kind of independently as well, personally, creatively? Stuart just spoke in a tone that felt from here. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, there were all forms of revolutionary rhetorics that were very appealing. I mean, in fact, mm -hmm. at one point in the mid-70s, we were going to join the MPLA and go and fight in Angola because we'd write <laughs> articles in the Black Liberator. So there were, there were other voices that were appealing, but Stuart had something. And I think that something had to do with the fact that he seemed concerned with our emergence. Mm -hmm. And I've subsequently discovered that to be the case, having looked through 
the near thousand hours of his archive. But I was like, you know, but you just felt it instinctively. You sensed that this was. Um, and listen, when you when you first encountered him, I, I mean, I knew his name before I knew who he was, mm -hmm. and and I was shocked to realize he was black. You know, I, I think most people who who got to know Stuart Hall are always shocked when they realize yeah. then that he's black. Mm -hmm. But there was a seminal program that he did called "End Have Racist Mom," which isn't actually in in the piece, mm -hmm. um, with the campaign against racism in the media. I think that was that was a turning point for us. I was mm -hmm. 78, 79. I remember seeing that on television and thinking, wow, you know, mm -hmm. when I grow up, I'm going to be just like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> he was eloquent. He was angry. He was articulate. Um, he seemed to marry the two things that I, I think was a struggle then, but isn't so much now, which was how to have this um, dissident voice and have it sit comfortably mm -hmm. with an intellectual one. For most of us, that seemed to be an either-or choice. Yeah, you know, yeah. You're either a dissident, in which case a refusenik and a Stagali and you know, uh, a Hugh P. Newton, mm -hmm. Black Panther type, or you're an intellectual, in which case you had nothing to do with the street. Or, you know, and Stuart's yeah. engagement with the popular, with the cultural, seemed to, to marry the two. In other words, he was both a radical and an intellectual. Yeah. And for bookworm kids, that was really important. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he's always been a kind of example mm -hmm. because of that. A charismatic example of what yeah. it is that's possible, what you could do with your life. Um, and, and by implication, what I'm saying is that Stuart, it's not so much that you wanted to be like him in a way, but he, he offered an example of agency, mm -hmm. an example of how to be, actively be that was compelling. Yeah. And um, many of us in the humanities who came across him were directly or indirectly influenced by that. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we learned something from that charismatic example, yeah, yeah. even when we didn't take the course that he did. Yeah. So that moment when the opportunity of the commission came about, um, that was going to be of this character that had been so influential in your personal life and your creative life, mm. um, how long ago was it that the kind of initial concept of the, of the unfinished conversation came about? Four years ago? I, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> um, well, uh, I suppose there are several uh, strands that came together with the unfinished. One was that uh, several members of the collective, Black Order, mm -hmm. Lena Gopal in particular, had been trying to persuade him really since the sort of early 90s to, mm -hmm. to allow us to do something on his life, but more of a straightforward documentary. And um, I mean, for the last six or seven years, uh, either David L. Bailey or uh, Mark Seeley or a combination of uh, the three of us had floated this mm -hmm. idea that something needed to be done mm -hmm. on the old man. Um, so, uh, when Mark first mooted this present incarnation mm -hmm. of it, you know, of course, all the work had been done before, and yeah. we were very, very up for it. But I mean, to be to be honest with you, the, the a lot of the times that the, the impulse for things that I do <laughs> nothing to do with films at all, but always to do with something else. I mean, the way Mark and I and Lena originally discussed this, this was a project to just get him going. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he'd not been very well. He's at home a lot, home a lot rather, yeah. sorry. And we were trying to find something that would engage him, you know, uh, something that would be a challenge mm -hmm. for him. Um, and it's only really quite a way down. So we had several meetings about yeah. what it could be. And, uh, it was only quite a way down that we realized. So he influenced the concept of the piece? Oh, yeah, or? very much. Yeah. I mean, we spoke um, either, either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was very clear during the course of the conversations what he didn't want to mm. do. Uh, and we arrived at that slowly. Mm -hmm. And it was also clear um, what he thought might be a waste of time and what he thought, you know. Um, but everything else he said, well, you know, yeah. That's kind of up to you. Mm -hmm. you. You go, John, and, and try and do that. So there were a set of um, 
prohibitions, if you like, for mm -hmm. want of a better word. Not, not prohibition, but certainly sort of areas that he wasn't personally interested in exploring. Mm -hmm. um, and it was clear that if that was, if those were the routes we wanted to take, it would be without his active participation, yes, yeah. but he would still support it. You yeah. know? And since the project was very much about trying to do something that ensnares his life in many of the ideas that he'd been floating for a while, it seemed necessary to, to have him as much mm -hmm. on board as possible. So there was no point in doing something he didn't want to do, mm -hmm. you see what I mean? Um, and one of the things he wanted to, uh, to explore um, after a series of meetings was this question of memory. Yeah. Um, and so slowly, that's what the project became. So it evolved from a potential documentary through to this exploration of memory. And, and how did it turn into, did you always know it was going to be a film installation for a gallery setting? Yes, yes. I mean, it was never, it never, it was never a film. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was never a documentary, quote unquote, in that sense. Uh, partly because the, the, the funding necessary to put this in place mm -hmm. had come via the art route anyway. Yeah. You know, so um, it's not that it closed off a single screen option or a documentary mm -hmm. option, but you know, um, the idea was to try and do something um, I'll put it this way. I mean, I think the thing I was very keen on was to take an idea, however small, of his mm -hmm. and see how much of it we can use to stitch together a set of disparate, discrete yeah. narratives, stories, ideas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and that was always there. What wasn't there was necessarily the, the, the triptych, but uh, over time it became clear that in order to, to do justice to, to the project, we had to do that. Um, I mean, it was, I was clear that this wasn't a film about Stuart Hall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the people say that all the time. It's, a film like, it's not about Stuart Hall. It's about Stuart Hall. It's about the making mm -hmm. of Stuart Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not, it's necessarily non-biographical. It's about how that category, Stuart Hall, mm -hmm. um, can come into being, given the constellation, given the array of narrative colliding and coalescing mm -hmm. at several historical junctures in the 60s and 70s, and crucially in the 30s and 40s, yeah. to produce this figure. Yeah. Know. And then maybe just, just kind of finally on the, on the use of the three screens in the piece, um, how yes. did you kind of make that, you say it became very clear that it, that's what it needed to be. Um, mm. Maybe just talk a little bit about what that, what that device allows you to do within the work. Yeah, I mean, the thing with, with, single, with single screen pieces, you, you're, you're very much working with narratives, mm -hmm. with stories, in one form or another. And, and the intensities you bring to things are over long stretches. Um, Anything other than a two-screen piece is almost molecular. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's um, you're really working with intensities and 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 flows of emotion, you know. Um, so you have to think much more in terms of frames than you would, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with a single screen. Weirdly enough, single screens allow you to be broadly cavalier with with storytelling. With a three-screen piece, you have to be slightly more, you know particular, more forensic, mm -hmm. um, and it drives you nuts. I mean, it's psychotic inducing, actually. I'd go to bed for a year and a half dreaming frames. I mean, uh, so yes, that's I, not just one yeah. film, it's three. I wouldn't recommend together. it <laughs> too often. Um, but that was the challenge. Mm -hmm. The challenge was you know, um, how to sustain certain intensities across three frames so that you can suggest the intermingling mm -hmm. of things, you know. Um, and sometimes that the idea was to hold on to, to a thought visually or, uh, or, you know, sonically long enough for it to register across the other two screens. Mm -hmm. And then once you feel that it has, you can drop it and, and change, you know. So it's those sorts of, it's, it's almost musical in its, in how it takes shape in your head, mm -hmm. uh, which is, not quite how it works 
with, with a single screen piece. Yeah. Slightly more, I mean, it, of course it's more challenging, but that's not the point. The point is that it's, it's the nature of the challenge, which is quite um, trying, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's say. But, but I think it's also more um, satisfying because you're never quite in control of it. You know, uh, the moments when you just have to go, okay, I'm, I'll just let this go. Mm -hmm. you know, we've just set this chain up. We just let it go and, and see what happens. And usually that's best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When the material itself starts to suggest the directions it wants to take, that's when you know the thing is working. Mm -hmm. Anything, that's when you know it's working mm -hmm. because they've they found their groove and they just, yeah. they're just going. You know. And Stuart, of course, hasn't seen the film in situ as an installation. Is that right? Or? No, he hasn't seen it um, in... A, well, no, actually, he has. He just hasn't seen it. We, we, we constructed a, a, a special single-screen, three-piece version, yeah. which, he, which he saw. It was actually a very moving uh, day, because there was about 20 of us. Yeah. And, um, yeah. A big response, yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Thank you so much, John. I'm aware we're kind of up to 8, eight o'clock already, and I did want to kind of make opportunity for... Yes, I'm sorry about that. I no, can't, no, no, shut no, up. Perfect, <laughs> uh, for, for other people to get involved in the conversation and to kind of pose any questions that they wanted to, to John. So if anybody has got anything they would like to ask, this gentleman here. Sir. Hi, I love the film. It's fantastic. But I've got a very small criticism. Please. You know the bass line? Hmm. Turn it down. Yeah. Point taken. <laughs> Point taken. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's a very um, large subwoofer. Okay. Uh, I thought I had it, but maybe I haven't. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Skinder? Yeah, but there's a, some questions posed to me earlier on about um, the, uh, the film, the year 1967, and Stuart Hall's thought and thinking process finishes around 1967. Somebody was asking me, what is Stuart Hall thinking today? And why did it end at 67 or 60 in that sort of late 60s in terms of the film? Right. In terms of the making of Stuart Right, Hall. right. I mean, um, the, the idea was to try and see whether we can flesh out this uh, thesis of his, that identities are products of these um, conjunctions, personal, you know, the interior and the exterior. And it seemed to me that by 68, all the options were on the table. <laughs> you know, uh, by 68, he had almost certainly decided that he was black. Uh, and um, beyond 68, we, we needed another thing in place. You know, all the, I think all the possible permutations on the theme of identity for me according to that thesis, had been explored by 68. So if you were going to do something else, if you're going to go beyond 68, you needed another, another engine, as it were. You know? So I stopped there because you know, I would just be repeating the, the strategy, visual and, and sonic strategies, and it didn't seem, didn't seem worth doing that. You know? um, what's he like now? Well, you know, he's like, he's like um, interestingly, um, he's just, um, along with, a group um, that he works with on a journal. Uh, they've just launched the manifesto. Um, so if you go online and Google him, he's very much alive. He's still not in the best of health, but given that, he's, he's still pretty sharp up there. Yeah, he's fine. I agree, I agree absolutely. I mean, you know, the, 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 po the, the point was, for me, 
what is the best way of, of constructing a post-biographic post -biographic project, which is about singular figure. You know, uh, you of course need to suggest the, the outlines of a life, but there are clearly lots of other things that, that are running almost as parallel lines with that life. Is there any causality possibly? I mean, you know, uh, there happen to be in quite a few of the lines that we've got running. Um, but I don't think it matters necessarily I mean, uh, that, that there are these connections. I mean, I don't think you need to know, for instance, that, that he was passionately involved with Vietnam, for instance. You know, I don't think you need to know that, or that he'd been to Cuba in 1960. You know. um, but these were, these were the, um, they're all in the ether, put it that way. And it's the baggage that becomes the left imaginary, if you like. And so he's as touched by it as, as quite a few other people of that generation and of that intellectual kind of persuasion. But yeah, absolutely, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. John, there was something else that's really good. I was looking back. That I think you might have said, I just wanted to clarify that um, during an interview where you said you were treated with some suspicion by the avant garde for the use of sound. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain uh, strand of high modernism that just doesn't like the sonic, <laughs> even the musicians. Um, but particularly in, in, in time-based practice, I mean, it was not unusual to, to watch you know, projects which had no sound at all, and, and for that to be somehow seen as pure. You know, it's a bit like black and white photography. <laughs> you know? uh, and we were definitely treated as Bulgarians. Uh, in, you know, uh, I, can't remember, I can't tell you the number of times people would say to me, well, why is there so much noise or music? Or, you know, um, we're actually music rather than noise. I mean, we were always interested in the sonic. Um, and I think people suspected that. They suspected that, that we weren't really from the church of the image. You know, and we're not. I mean, there's no reason why we have to be. You know, when you're a person of color, the history of the image is not really your friend. <laughs> so I don't see why I need to be so friendly with the image all the time. You know, um, I'm I'm interested in interrogating it and questioning it and sometimes propping it up. You know, but it has not been a friend most of the time. Um, and. I think it's only really very recently that people start to think, oh, well, maybe we still don't want to do what they do, but, but we might start to consider it legitimate. <laughs> but for, yeah, for, for decades, at least two, um, the key sort of antagonism between, let's say, what we did and several other members of the avant-garde was, was to do with sound, the fact that there was always an excess of it in what we did. Um, and on the whole, they didn't really buy the theoretical reasons for, for that. It, it didn't matter. I mean, we, we knew what we were doing, and we were going to continue to do that. You know. um, sorry, I, I'm running into a <laughs> I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> uh. um, several people have been asking already, John, where the piece is going to be shown again. And I believe it's going to be elsewhere in the UK. And in London later this year? Yes, yes, it's going to the Tate. Um, going to be part of their opening of their Tate Britain mm -hmm. new wing. Uh, so Tate Britain. Yeah, we don't know when. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that seems to be a debate that's been going on quite a bit. Yeah. But yes, it will be. It, it's going there. And there is going to be a single screen presentation of the piece? But there is a documentary that we've made yeah. on his life. Uh, but. Um, just to clarify here, because sometimes this comes up, it's certainly not a comp I mean, it's a companion piece, but mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not this made into mm. a documentary. It mm -hmm. has a very different premise, but you'd have to watch it yeah. <laughs> to yeah, find that. Um, it has a very different premise, a much more musical premise. Yeah. Uh, all to do with Miles Davis, but you'll have to watch it <laughs> to figure it out. Mm. Hopefully we'll show it here at some point. Sorry, before you, there was somebody at the back there, yeah. Um, my question is, if you know, deconstruct the narrative to 
Yeah, this, this was one of those questions that came up again and again before. Um, I can't tell you how much this, is, this question has haunted black <laughs> cultural practice and, and, and politics, in a way. You know, um, because the, the idea is that the elevation of difference destroys the bigger narrative. Um, I happen to believe the opposite, but, but that's a much more complicated argument uh, and discussion, you know. Um, which is not to say, I mean, I think there was a sort of moment in the 80s when it was an either or. You were either a grand narrative disciple or a micro narrative kind of person. This is stupid. These are, these are not debates that should be had in those terms. Uh, there's certainly in, in, enough. Um, to suggest that one need not be without the other. You know, uh, listen, you know, black Marxists in the radical tradition, whether it's Du Bois or Claude McKay or any of these people, insisted on being black and Marxists, insisted on being communist and, and black. You know, in fact, I'm just working on a film now about a guy who was the seminal figure behind the, the um, March on Washington. Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was a Quaker, pacifist, gay, black, socialist. And he was all of those things at the same time. You know, you don't have to give up something in order to participate in grand projects. And my suspicion is really to do with the attempt to silence facets. You know, Rustin, most of his life, was being told, oh, well, you can't organize a march in Washington because you're gay, or you can't, you, you can't be next to Martin Luther King because you're a Marxist, or you can't, you know, like, please. <laughs> he did it. Uh, and uh, you just look at his life, you can see it's possible. It's possible to have difference and committed to grand projects. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive, it seems to me. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, things like Bits of Waves. Mm -hmm. Love it. I love Virginia Woolf. I always have done. Uh, it's, in fact, I did, I was one of the guinea pigs for women's studies in this country. I did one of the, I think, the first O level in it. And I was introduced to a room on one's own then. This is the mid 70s. So I've always loved Virginia Woolf. But I particularly like the waves because, I mean, the, the, the sense of light as character is just extraordinary in that novel. And I've always wanted something, a project that, that would take you know, the stream of consciousness that she brings to fashioning light as a character in the, in the novel. And this seemed the right one. You know, it just seemed one of those suggestive possibilities that could be chucked into the stew on the life of stew or <laughs> without it destroying anything, you know. Um, and what's extraordinary for me now, looking back on the piece, is how it almost feels like it was always there, you know, like Stuart Hall and Virginia Woolf. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Why should they not talk together? You know, but, but it took a while to, to convince myself uh, that this marriage would work. I love Virginia Woolf. I always have done. Uh, and don't buy all that nonsense about her being a bourgeois feminist. It's rubbish. There's <laughs> no such thing. Uh, One more at the back there. Yes, thanks very much for the uh, fantastic talk as well. I was going to say, um, you indicated that at some point during the film, Yes.
sense. You had faith in the subject, which you knew that would happen if you uh, followed your uh, instincts. Mm. Mm. I, I, I love jazz. Anyone who knows me knows that. I love free jazz in particular. Uh, I love that, that moment that you sense every time you watch a free jazz performance when people go, okay, we're going for the break now. Let's all just take it to the break. And then you're free. <laughs> and everyone can just head off, but just be aware of each other. You know, it's just committing to the moment is important for me. Because uh, I think you need, to, you need to respect the integrity of things, the ontology of things, by just allowing them the space to, to start. And then you bring in the intensity of your own reflection. At that point, it becomes a dialogue. You know, uh, and all the richer for it. Uh, so the in-between, yeah. I mean, it's just going into that in-between and finding a rationale for continuing the dialogue between you and, and these disparate elements, which is, that's the fun bit. Because you know, if you know beforehand, I'm not sure. I was going to say, because what, for example, is what actually, when you started off as a student in the university, it probably perceived fairly on that there was a need for something, wasn't there? Because it took people being answered in the established uh, kind of curriculum. Yes, no, I mean, that's. It, 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 this is a slightly tricky thing to say. Um, because like all refuse Nick manifestos, of course, you have to know the, the earlier narrative in order to be a refuse Nick, you know. Uh, and as I've, I've tried to always give the impression that we weren't, we weren't savages. I mean, I mean that metaphorically. I mean, we understood the histories of representation. I did my whole thesis on on culture and discourse theory uh, before I even started looking at making anything, you know. Um, so we knew the histories of representation we were confronted with, and we knew that the formation of modernity was built on this phantasmatic ground of difference, into which was written all sorts of values, you know, black, white, evil, etc. Et you know, we, we knew this stuff, and, and we knew the traces of it, we could see the traces of it. So the project was informed by that backstory, if you like, from the beginning. And it's still, it's now just a, a kind of default, you know, you, 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 you were aware that the, what the philosophers used to call the Western epistem has these slightly unpleasant things in it about you as a person of color. And, and uh, the project is not to reject to call that episteme. It's always to see how one could either reroute its possibilities or write oneself in it without, you know, um, compromising both the project and, uh, and and the subject that you're trying to insert into these into these grand narratives. So you know, it's a complicated practice, a complicated project. But it is about saying ignorance is not enough. You do have to know what you're against. And when you know what you're against, you know, fight intelligent. You know, fight, fight with some clarity of purpose as well. Doesn't mean that you have to be clear <laughs> in what you're saying, but, but do try and have clarity about what it is that you're trying to do it for. Yes, there was. Yeah, I mean, if, uh, this is a slightly longer debate. If you don't mind, we'll have it. We'll have it over over a glass. But no, I agree. I agree. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Maybe yeah, over a glass of wine downstairs. Yes, but, uh, indeed. Um, thank you for sharing all of your thoughts. So much to talk about. Hopefully, we'll go in lots of other directions with the symposium as well. But mm -hmm. thanks so much for your time. Um, the piece is still running downstairs. We're open till, till nine. The bar is open. Um, enjoy the rest of the evening. And if you'll join me in giving John a round of applause.